introduction to Don is if you've been to his backyard before, you know that he's the man to talk about this. Don is into butterflies, into butterflies, into butterflies, and so let's let let's hear from him. How's that? Okay, good. <laughs> well, let's see. What do I do with my uh, the little remote thing? Maybe it's in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> that would that would figure it out. Okay, I wanted to talk about just two of our local butterflies and their host plants. We have about a uh, hundred butterflies that you might see in Harris and Montgomery County. Uh, and moths outnumber them, about 15 to 1, so we have about 1,500 moths. So there's a, there's a big insect population here, potentially. Uh, unfortunately, it's going downhill instead of uphill, uh, which means that the things that feed on the insects is, are also going down, such as the birds. So if you want to have birds and butterflies and such as that, you need to have the, the native plants that they uh, utilize. And the native plants utilize Hmm. Doesn't seem to be going. Oh, maybe I was going in the wrong direction. Okay, this is the first one I was going to talk about. This is the uh, the spice bush swallowtail. I was going to cover just two butterflies because I thought that's about as much as I could do it because I like to give a lot of detail and more than people want to know probably. But anyhow, this is this is the, the that's the spice bush butterfly. It's a beautiful butterfly. Uh, this is its range in Texas. You can see the red red border there, that outlines where you would find this butterfly in Texas. You won't find it essentially outside of that range, except maybe in a rare occasion, maybe on someone's radiator or windshield or something like that. But, but you won't find it outside of those red lane lines very often. And the reason for that is it has two host plants in Texas, uh, actually two, two native host plants across the entire United States. And the two that it uses are spice bush, which the butterfly is named for, and sassafras, which is Seen around here occasionally, you'll, you'll see it. Uh, has pretty orange leaves in the fall. Uh, you can make tea out of it if you know what you're doing. Uh, not recommended, really. Uh, but this is these two plants. The sassafras, as you can see, it's, that's the blue shade on the, on the right of the slide. That's where the sassafras grows in Texas. The spice bush has two main populations, one out in the hill country, which is kind of stranded, and then one in East Texas that extends all the way over to the south and east uh, across the southern part of the United States. So these, these two, uh, two plants are the basis for the food for this particular butterfly. If you don't have one of those plants, you won't have that butterfly, or if you see it, it will just be an occasional visitor that's flying in from somewhere else. So if you want to have that one in your, in your yard, uh, plant the spice bush. Uh, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Here we go. This is what the spice bush looks like in the spring. It has uh, pretty little yellow flowers. Uh, mine are starting to bud right now. In another couple of weeks, there'll be pretty little yellow flowers like this. It has uh, both male and female plants. So uh, I guess if you want to have berries, you well, you certainly need the female plant, but you probably would want to have both. I happen to have both, which is just by accident. Uh, but these, this one is, this was, uh, I think, a male plant. Uh, it is not pollinated by the butterfly, though. It's not pollinated by the spice bush wallowtail. It is pollinated by bees and flies. So that's the, the pollinator for it early because this, the butterfly is not out or it hasn't emerged yet for a spring brood when this is blooming. So it's just not around. The reason it's not around is there are no leaves for the caterpillars to eat. This is what that plant looks like in the spring. It's a multi-trunk plant. It grows about as tall as the ceiling here. And it's similar, similar diameter. So don't plant it right against the base of your house, but you can plant it next to your house or plant it uh, at the edge of a tree line or something. It's essentially a, a bush that likes to grow part shade. So heavy, dense shade is not the best spot for it. Bright, full sun is a little bit tough on it, but it'll take that better than a heavy, dense shade. But it likes just a, a forest edge is its ideal situation. And that's the ideal for a lot of, a lot of plants. That's also a, a special eco spot or niche that you might, might think about where, where different 
things come together like a, a plain or with grass and a forest right on the edge, that's where you'll find the most diverse population of almost anything, whether it's insects or birds or whatever, it'll be right at the forest edge. Uh, this is what the berries look like later in the fall. Uh, pretty red berries, uh, about 20 species or so of birds eat these berries. It's uh, beneficial for, for a lot of birds and wildlife as well as butterflies. So, you know, it's just a good general all-around plant. It's a nice looking plant. I recommend that everyone should have one. If you can't find one, come visit us at March. We'll have some at March Mart. Um, this is the, the egg of the spice bush swallowtail. Uh, it's a little white sphere. Uh, that's typical of all the swallowtail family. They will have a spherical egg. Uh, they lay it on the bottom side of the leaf where it's concealed. Uh, and the, the female swallowtail, when it comes in, it's, it, can, it can sense generally that there's a the tree is, a host plant is a neighborhood with its antenna, it picks up the chemical signals. But in order to really hone in on it, most butterflies, they actually land on the plant. So if you'll see the butterfly flying around and, the, and there's a plant, it'll come in and it'll just kind of tap down and it'll bounce off. It's testing it, it's tasting the, the plant because they have chemical sensors in their feet and they can actually tell whether it's the right plant or not. So if they, if they do that, then you know, okay, that's probably a female butterfly looking for a host plant if it's going around just sampling things like that. If it's visiting flowers, no, it's on something else. But, but if it's visiting plants and doing that, it's probably looking for a host plant. This is the little baby caterpillar that hatches out. After about three or four days, this little guy hatches out. Now, he is very tender. He's a good morsel for something to eat, but he's so small he's probably overlooked because he's only, you know, the egg was about the size of a pencil point. Well, he was coiled up inside that egg. So he's not very big, and his teeth are not very strong, so he can only eat the very tenderest part of a plant leaf. So the female butterfly always lays the egg near the tip of the freshest growth on the tree. So look for, the, look for this egg at the tips underneath side and the freshest growth. That's where the egg will be. Now when he gets a little bigger, he has this kind of a look. Uh, he's a cute little fella. Uh, he's kind of getting some eyes that you can see there. There are false eyes actually. Those are not real eyes, but they look like eyes. They kind of bulge out like an eyeball. Uh, but he has already started, he's, he's already made his first molt, which means the, the caterpillars, as they grow from the egg to their full, full size, it's about a 2,000 fold increase in size. So their skin, being an exoskeleton, can only stretch so far. So what they have to do is they, they shed their skin, just like a snake or a lizard, uh, as they get bigger, they have to get a new skin. So they, as they grow and get a little bigger, they will spin a pad with their spinneret and at their mouth parts, and then they will grab a hold of that with the back end, and then they, as this new skin has grown underneath the old one, they essentially crawl out of the old skin with their, their little six pro legs, their true legs, while the back end is held on, and they just essentially crawl out of their skin. So that's how, they, that's how they do it. So you'll see a little, little residue of the, of the caterpillar usually behind it after it has done a fresh molt. Uh, this is where this little guy hides now. He will have, if you look down at the bottom of the leaf there, that's my hand so get you an idea of the scale. He has eaten down here at the very bottom. That's where he started out at the tip. Then after he gets a little bit bigger and his teeth get a little stronger, he moves up the leaf and he cuts a section across it halfway across the leaf. It doesn't go all the way across, just halfway to the cross, right to the midrib. And then he starts spinning back and forth, back and forth across that leaf. And as the silk shrinks, it tightens and shrinks as the, as the silk dries, and it pulls that leaf over to make that flap. And so that's how he makes that flap. It's just a thousand little threads that he has gone back and forth. And that when it shrinks, it pulls the leaf over and folds it, and that gives him a place to hide. So he's hiding in there. So if you ever want to find this caterpillar, look for these folded leaves. 
Unfortunately, the, the uh, wasps and things look for these too, but uh, that, is, that is where you will find them. You won't, all, you won't always find them. A lot of times you'll find an empty one. More often you'll find an empty fold than a full one because only about 2% or so of the, of the caterpillars actually survive because most of them are used to feed birds and other insects and whatever. Uh, so that's, caterpillars are a very important part of the food chain because they are what feeds the little baby bluebirds and such. So if you want to have, have the, the birds, you need to have some of these caterpillars. This is one of them. Uh, here he is. This is the next mold. Here he's, here he's changed into what I call the, the bird poop stage. Uh, you look at, he's, he's even got a nice little shine that looks like a, a fresh one so that, you know, no, nothing would really want to eat something that's, that's that fresh and gooey and nasty looking. Uh, so that's his, that's his, his uh, disguise. But they feed at night, so mostly he'll be curled up in that little leaf flap. But when he does come out, he'll be like this. But mostly they feed at night to avoid the predators because things do like to eat them. Even though the spice bush leaf has some chemicals in it, some say it tastes kind of like turpentine. I haven't verified that. Uh, but I suspect that it does have some chemical uh, additions to it that the plant has developed to try to protect itself from being eaten. And of course the insects, they adapt. And so that's why there are a lot of pairings like this where, where the caterpillar will only eat a certain, certain kind of plant even though the plant has tried to prevent things from eating it uh, through evolutionary trends. So this is the next one. See now, he's, he's added some blue dots to him now. He's, he's gotten quite a bit bigger. He's got, he's got a row of blue dots there. I think it's kind of an attractive look. Still has kind of the bird poop look, but he's got, got that going for him. And then here's the last instar. This is the this is the last one. This is the this is no, he's goes, this is the fifth different look of this particular caterpillar. So each time a caterpillar molts or sheds its skin, it doesn't have to look like it did before. And so a lot of these are bizarre. You know the the looks of them. This one is, I think looks like a snake, but he did keep his little blue blue dots. I thought I think those are attractive. He has kind of what I would say is big blue eyes. Uh, Pretty, pretty little caterpillar. He's, he's one of my favorite caterpillars just because of, of how he looks here. Uh, he also has one other defense. This, this is a, he has what uh, they call osmeterium or something like that. They're, they're, they're stink horns. Uh, if this caterpillar is disturbed, if a bird comes up and finds it and pecks at it, he'll rear up on his back legs like this, like a snake, and he'll put out these little orange horns and they stink like crazy. They smell bad. If you've ever picked one up off of a, off of a dill or something like that, that's, that's not this caterpillar, but it's in the same family. The swallowtail family are the only ones that have this particular defense that I'm aware of. And anyhow, they use this as, as a last resort to keep something from eating it because they really do smell bad. So if, if, you, if you irritate them, you know, try not to irritate them, but if you do, that's what it'll do, and you will smell it. Now this is a head-on view of this little guy. The head is actually way down there at the very bottom. Uh, it's not that yellow thing you see there. That's, that's just kind of a fake mouth or something. Uh, the, the stink horns come out right below that yellow thing at the bottom. Uh, and those are not his real eyes, of course. So that's how he looks. I think this, this is kind of a, a Batesian uh, mimicry where something uh, mimics a different kind of animal or plant or something else to fool the fool potential predators. So that is, uh, that is his look for this. I think he, it's been suggested that he either could be mimicking a, a green tree frog or a snake or an animal, uh, something of that sort. I particularly favor this one. This is, this is the green tree snake uh, that we have around here, a Texas green snake. Uh, it's a cute little snake. It's perfectly harmless, uh, but it does feed on insects, I assume. Uh, but that's the front look. I think man, it's kind of a pretty good, pretty good look. Yeah, the first one of this, first time I ever saw that particular caterpillar, I was about this tall. Then I, I ran in and told my mom that there was a there was a terrible cobra of some sort out in the backyard, and she needed to come and get it. <laughs> and I think she probably had a pretty good laugh about that. But <laughs> but I, I was I was terrified when I was. I mean, you know, I didn't know any better, uh, and. 
still now I think, oh, that's really pretty cute. But <laughs> that time I didn't think it was so cute. Uh, this is the chrysalis from it. Uh, right before the butter, uh, the caterpillar uh, forms its chrysalis, it poops out everything it's got in its gut. It, everything goes out uh, and so that gives it this kind of a yellowish color because a lot of the color has been drained from him. So he's, he is now that. You'll notice that he's, he's got, again, just like when he was molting, he formed a, a silk pad down for the bottom to grab a hold of. But this time, he also made himself some suspenders up the top. See that little loop there? He has made, he's just like a linesman. He's got his, his anchor around him and he's got his toes tied into the pole, and so he's, he's secured himself there. And that's, that's right before he, this will, again, it'll, it'll split right along the back, just like it did in all the other stages. But this time, when, it, when he comes out, it'll be something different. And this is, this is what the chrysalis looks like. Uh, you can see it still has the, see the silk pad on the leaf there, and then you can see the little, little suspender coming across, and the silk pad down at the bottom. So that's how he was held on there. Uh, this also comes in a brown form. Uh, yeah, Mike? Are they, do they normally um, put the chrysalis on the spice bush itself? Uh, they, they frequently will. These, these did because I had them in a jar. Uh, <laughs> and they couldn't do anything else. Uh, a lot of caterpillars, they will move off of their host plant. Um, and in the, these, will, these will, will generally move off of the host plant. I've never found one on the host plant. But so they probably are moving off, but you know, they're hard to find. If you don't know they're there, it's really hard to find these guys, especially when they're brown like this. The brown ones tend to be on something that's brown and the green ones will be on something that's green. So you really, you really don't see them. They're not moving or threshing about. They're just kind of blend in. They've even got, you know, the, the veination on the, on the chrysalis, uh, even it's camouflage -y. Uh, again, after about two weeks, this butterfly will hatch out. Uh, that is about a, a typical thing for them is two weeks, except for in the fall. In the fall, they overwinter as the chrysalis. So this butterfly has about three generations during a year. It'll have this one, the, the one, the, the chrysalis will either hatch out in the midsummer and then they'll have one generation. But the one that hatches out in the spring, then he, he will have probably two additional generations, uh, and the third one will be the overwintering one. But it's a beautiful butterfly, and that's a plant that I would highly recommend for your yard. It, it's a multi-trunk shrub, it's a pretty plant, uh, yellow leaves in the fall, uh, and easy to grow here, uh, not hard to grow. Uh, this, is, this is one final thing about this butterfly. He gets some additional protection from being eaten because he mimics, in addition to the, the snake as a caterpillar, the, but the, the adult butterfly uh, looks like the pipe vine swallowtail a lot. So if it's flying, it's hard to tell the difference between the one on the right and the one on the left. And even when they're stopped on a wrist, there's still this orange spot underneath. And so it's, it's kind of hard. So most birds, if they see it, they leave it alone just because it looks like the other one. And the other one is taste really bad. Again, I haven't verified that, but that's, that's the report. It does make birds a little upset when they eat that. Uh, this is the other butterfly I was going to talk to you about. Uh, okay. 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 Yes. I, I have a quick question. Um, do all caterpillars purge themselves before they go through chrysalis? Uh, don't, I, there may be some that just go into leaf litter and just kind of hang out there. But most of them, in order to squirm out of their old skin, they have to kind of tie onto something so they can get out of the skin. So, but when they purge themselves before they- Oh, oh, you're, oh, you're talking, oh, the purge. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you said perch. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, they, they will do that. Okay. Uh, and that, that particularly makes them vulnerable because some wasps hone in on the smell and they follow the smell. No, no, they don't parasite. Oh, they, they actually come and attack them and they will, they will carry them back to, the, to their wasp nest and feed them to their grubs. So that's what happens. Yes? So the, you said it, the egg itself is the size of a pencil point. Mm -hmm. If you were just to turn over the leaf with just normal eyesight, would you see it? Or would you yes. Eat a, okay, you will see you it. You can see it. I mean, 
Yeah, you'll see it because it's, it's because of the contrast. It's a it'll be a white. Uh, some of them come, sometimes some butterflies like this like that uh, pipe vine swallowtail. The the eggs on it will actually be orange. So yeah, the, you'll you'll see it if you flip it over. You can see it. It's it's not like it's microscopic. It's big enough that you would see it. It's just not very big. Uh, this is this is the goat weed leaf wing butterfly. It's another one of my favorites. Uh, this is one you won't see very often. You won't see this one either if you don't have the the particular host plant, which is very common around here, fortunately. Uh, if you see both, you see both butterflies here, right? Yeah, one of them is, is kind of disguised because that's that's why they call it a leaf wing because the underneath side of this butterfly or the or when it's folded, it's folds this butterflies fold their wings up over their back. Moths usually lay them out flat. So that's a way, one way of telling butterflies from moths is, is how they perch. But you can see these, these guys, the one on the left there, he has angled himself to where he doesn't even cast a shadow. That's how they do it. They, you, if, you, if you don't know that butterfly's there, you will not see it unless it flies. And then when it flies, that's one of its means of escape, obviously, is to fly. But the other thing is that it's so bright orange, you're following the bright orange, and then when it lands, it all of a sudden disappears, and you have no clue as to where it went. Because it's just, boom, and it's gone. It's like it exploded and dis disappeared. So it's, it's really hard to see that butterfly if you don't know exactly where it is. You, don't, you need to know within an inch or so of where it is, or you won't see it. Uh, this is the range for this one. It's essentially across all of Texas. So this butterfly, you, you, you will find it here. Um, that is its host plant here is the is goat weed or woolly croton. Um, it will come up early in your, in your garden, any place where you have a bare patch of soil, this will probably come up. And it will almost certainly have eggs laid on it within a very short time of coming up because the butterfly of this particular, of this butterfly overwinters as an adult. It doesn't overwinter as a chrysalis. It overwinters as an adult. So the female is at, at, on a warm, early, very early spring day. As soon as these little plants come up, they're out looking for them. And they, again, will lay the eggs right on the underneath side. Usually, usually they'll find them when the plant is only in its little two-leaf form. Uh, and that is a, it's really, really a, a cool little thing, and you won't, even, you won't even notice that sometimes they'll lay two or three eggs on a single little plant, which I think, oh, I don't know if I will ever, ever make it. But then, you know, predation takes care of that kind of a problem. The reason it's over the whole part of Texas is that there are other species of, of croton that live out across the western part of the state. So this is the, the one that's on our side, uh, is the woolly croton. Uh, and that's, that's the one they use here. But it will be across the whole state, so you don't have to worry about necessarily planting host plant for this one. But I think it's, it's a good idea to leave a couple because you will, you will see it. Uh, this is what the plant looks like. This is a big, big one. Uh, you've probably seen this. You've probably pulled them out of your yard. Um, it has, has these kind of fuzzy, fuzzy little blooms. The leaf is kind of a blue-gray almost. It's a, and the, it'll get about this tall, about this big around if you let it. Uh, it's a, just a, an interesting looking plant. Uh, you see them in uh, abandoned fields or road, roadsides, you'll see this plant a lot. Uh, but that's the, that's the host plant for that particular butterfly in this area. Uh, this is the egg. Uh, you see there are two eggs on this particular leaf. Uh, again, these are spherical little, these are almost translucent. Uh, but that's, those, are the, those are the butterfly eggs, again, very small. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you, you won't see them, but they'll always, again, they'll be on the underneath side. Uh, the butterfly usually picks a, a tender new growth. Uh, this, is, this is the baby caterpillar. I, you can see it right there. I marked it where the caterpillar is. Uh, he is hard to see. The, the, you, look for, you have to look for, look, for the, look for leaves that at the end, they have this little tendril sticking out like that and they're chewed on. That's the way you will be able to find this particular caterpillar. It, otherwise, you will never see it because it, it takes that kind of a thing. I don't know what that little beetle was doing getting into the Photoshop. He, he photobombed me, but he was, he was not supposed to be there. Um, but that's the little caterpillar out there on the end. And look, see, it's got that little, little thing going out there. Uh, that's kind of an interesting feature for this butterfly. Here he is. Uh, 
This is the this is a this is the next instar. He's a little bit bigger, but if you see this little ropey thing going out there, uh, that is actually a very interesting feature. This this family of butterflies or this genus of butterflies. Uh, forms what is known as frass chain. Essentially, they're, they're poop chains. Um, the little, little caterpillar, you see he's got on his back? Those are little caterpillar turds. Then what he has done, as he has, as he has eaten and generated all these little poops, he has stuck them on his back. Then he walks out to the end of the leaf and he glues them end to end to make a chain. And so he's made a little long chain. These things can be, oh, this long. Uh, he is, it makes a little, little thing, and they call these frass chains. Uh, that's a polite way of saying instead of turd chains or whatever. He's, he's, they, they, they call them frass chains, and they, they, uh, they go out to the end of it. And that is where they will hide if they, during the daytime or if they feel threatened or something like that. They go out. Here he is going back for another load. Uh, and he forgot one. It looks like he's got one hanging off the back. Uh, but that's, that's what he's doing. He spends his time, he, he chews, he goes out and does that. Uh, and he will do this for, for quite a while. Uh, I guess the theory is that while he's small, he's likely to be uh, the victim of an ant or something like that, and that no self-respecting ant will walk down that frass chain to get to him that they would they would I don't know you know I, I wouldn't want that all over my six feet or whatever if I was going out there to get him so uh, that's that's uh, that's the one of their defenses aside from from being just really hard to see because they blend in so well here he is this is he's gotten a little bigger now when they get a little bigger they adapt some of the same strategies that the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar did here he has folded up the leaf again by essentially making his little silk threads across the leaf, back and forth, back and forth, and as the thread shrinks, pulls the leaf over, so it makes a little cylinder, and he hides inside the cylinder. So when it gets a little bigger, look for these little rolled up leaves, and that's where you'll find a caterpillar. He will always be facing outward with his head sticking out. That's his head that you see right there, not the back end of it. It's always the head sticking out. He's very particular about that. I guess it's defensive that way. Uh, here he is, a little bigger. Uh, notice how well he blends in with the, with the colors of that leaf. Even the little, little white dots on him just mimic very closely the appearance of that leaf. So he is you know, really hard to see. So you have to just look for the curled up leaf if you want to try to find this caterpillar. Uh, well, what was I saying? Was, he is. He is a true Texan in how they do this. I have watched them and when they're going back into their leaf fold, if they're, they're out eating, he comes up and he walks down, he makes a U-turn it and he backs in. He's, I thought, he's, he's like a Texas pickup truck driver. He's, he's always got to back into the slot. So that's how he does, he backs right in there. Uh, it's just real cute to see him do that. Uh, this is the chrysalis. Uh, it's, again, it's a very, very, uh, well camouflaged one. It looks, it has veins on the chrysalis that really blend in pretty much like the leaf. It looks, looks very much uh, like, like the leaf. You will, you will not see the chrysalis. This is one that I had, to, I had to rear them in order to get the picture because going out and looking for one, you will not find them. Uh, so just grow, let, let some of the plants grow and you will have this particular, particular caterpillar. Again, this would, hatches out typically in a few weeks. Uh, if you want to get a picture of one perched on your finger, you need to really raise one because otherwise they won't perch on your finger. Um, that one is, his wings weren't completely solidified, so he was still willing to sit there on my finger. Uh, about three minutes after that, he took off. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's not gonna hang around. Uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting, you can see all the veins on it underneath him. It looks just like a leaf. And that's the, the dead leaf uh, mimic. Now, here's a group of them. Uh, they do not feed on flowers. Uh, they don't nectar. So they don't, they don't go to your flowers. So you, you can plant all the flowers you want. They don't care. Uh, they want to find the goat weed plant that they can use, which is, which is perfect for them. Uh, but they use that for the caterpillar. As the adult, they get rotten fruit, 
or tree sap or something like that, and they will get their nutrients from that. Uh, so, oh, these, oh, I forgot. Whoops. These guys, they're on, so we saw out here there was a, there was a bacris bush. That's what these guys are on. There was a break in the stem on this one, and there were, when I went out to take it, I saw them, and I, there, were, there were five of them on it, and when I, by the time I got my camera and came back out, there were three, but I took a picture.